Hey everyone and welcome to another week of Church at Home. We are together even though we are apart and even though it's tough to not be together, I just want to say that I hope you moms have taken full advantage of having Mother's Day at home. I hope you're in your pajamas, that you've got coffee, and that you are prepared to hear a word from the Lord for you. Today is Mother's Day and we just celebrate all of you amazing moms, all of uh, all that you do day in and day out. I feel very, very privileged to get to share this message today and I want to say a very happy Mother's Day to my own mom and my mother in love and I'm just so grateful for, for all of those women who have impacted me significantly. Love you all. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, let's jump into the word because God's got things to say. Before we do, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for the gift of mothers. And Lord, we recognize that you command us to honor our mothers and our fathers. And Father, I pray that as we observe this day, that we would choose to see rightly. Lord, whatever emotions we bring with us to this day, whether they're grief or pain, regret, uh, feelings of abandonment, whatever it is, Lord, we choose to celebrate the gift of those who have gone before and made a way for us to be here. Thank you for the wisdom of mothers, for the love of mothers, for the way that mothers show us who you are. And God, I pray today you would show each mother who you are, how you love her, how very, very, very significant she is. And I pray you would refresh her. I pray you would encourage her. Restore, Father. Restore the things that are, are growing dim, are growing weary, and may even be dead. I pray you restore the joy of her salvation and I pray you would restore her vision in hearing your word Lord that it's not just a word that she hears today and walks away tomorrow but God it's a word that sticks with her for the rest of her life that this is a word that will equip her for greatness that you've called her to in your kingdom for your purposes I ask this in your precious name Jesus amen amen well, I've got a lot to say as per usual, and uh, I've, I am, uh, I've got a tight timeline here. So let's jump in. I wanted to start by, by using a case study of a person who was tremendously impacted by his mother. This is someone that for sure you've heard about. His name is Thomas Edison. Hmm. And kind of important person. He was a brilliant man, known even today as one of America's greatest inventors. He made incredible technological advances in the area of electricity, mass communication, sound recording, motion pictures. In fact, we can do what we're doing right now because of this man. But something that you might not know about Thomas Edison is that his early beginnings were really, really tough. And in fact, when he went to school, he had teachers that considered him mentally deficient. They thought he was stupid. And I would imagine that they told him that. He was a boy who was considered different. And so because he was different, he wasn't as valuable, perhaps, as other children. But this was the response of his mother. His mother took him out of school and homeschooled him. And she spoke the truth. This is a woman of faith. Spoke the truth of who God said he was over him again and again and again. And this little boy who was considered to be mentally deficient became a man with such a resolve, with such a resilience, 
such a spirit of, I can do this, that he changed the world. And I want to talk about this important quality that mothers can walk in and, and in doing so, not just transform our own children's lives, but transform all of history just from this one quality. First of all, let me share a couple of the quotes that Thomas Edison is known for saying. He's saying, I've not failed. I found 10,000 ways that won't work. What an awesome attitude. He also said this, our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is to always try just one more time. Man, he is a spirit of a, a victorious person. Listen to what else he said. Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. What an amazing and remarkable man. But it is important to know that Thomas Edison was not silent about the contribution of his mother to his life. In fact, he says, I love it. My mother was the making of me. He attributed many of his attitudes and resilience to his mother. His mother was a mother that refused to allow the limits of others to be placed upon her own child. She was a mother that did not allow the assessment of the reality to dictate the future of her child's potential. And that was something that I believe God wants us all. It's a quality. It's the quality of, of having great vision. God wants us to be as women and as men, people of great vision. And the word that I would use is, is great prophetic vision. And this is the quality that I want to actually highlight today. And don't be thrown off by the word prophetic because it just simply means that we have vision that is not dictated by what we see only, by the reality of what we see. But our vision is dictated by God's greater reality, by what God says can be and by who God says we can be in and through him. Do you know what another word for this vision is? It's just simply faith. That we are a women, mothers, a people of great faith that we look at a situation that seems impossible and we see rightly. We see, yeah, this is the real, the real situation, but God, you can do great things in this situation. This is what faith is. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for is going to happen and the assurance that even though we do not see it happening, God will do what he says he will do. This kind of vision, this kind of ability to see beyond just the circumstance is something that is fiercely powerful. I already shared how it can change not just a life, but all of history. And I want to talk to you about how you can walk in this kind of vision as a woman of God. We don't want to just allow our situation, what the facts are, to inform our lives. We're in a, a time in history where there's a lot of facts coming at us. There's a lot of experts speaking, and it's important to look and to see what is being said. But we need to know that as people by faith, we walk out the purposes of God and we bring down the reality of heaven in and through our lives. We speak the truth of what God says into the reality of the circumstance. And that's in, in our, our, our lives, our children's lives, our, our workplaces, everywhere that we go. This is what it means to be a person of great prophetic vision. We were not created by God to simply live our lives with a naturalistic view. 
What is a naturalistic view? It's a humanistic view. One that would say that we can have all the answers. We can figure it all out. We can have control of all the circumstances. We can know, and if we don't know, then it isn't something. <laughs> it doesn't exist if we can't know all the details. And that is really arrogant, and that is not who we want to be. We want to be people of great faith knowing that our God can do impossible things and he's waiting to do impossible things in and through us. And without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please God. Romans 4 outlines why Abraham was chosen to become the father of many nations. And, and the scripture is clear that God didn't choose Abraham because he was perfect because he had all his life in order, or because he followed the rules perfectly, the thing that moved the Spirit of God towards Abraham was Abraham's faith to take God's word at face value. He believed that God was who he said he was, and he believed that God would do what he said he would do. Verse 17, Abraham believed in the God who brings dead things to life and who creates new things out of nothing. This is essentially prophetic vision. Vision that looks beyond the circumstances. Vision that looks beyond what the, the reality of the now is and into what could be. Just as Thomas Edison's mother, she saw her son. And yeah, the reality said that he was not very bright. But she said, you know, I am going to speak a better word over my son. And I am going to let him know if he fails the first time, then he tries again. And if he fails the next time, then he tries again. And she spoke a courage into him. That's what encouraging is. It's speaking courage into another person. And that is who we are called to be as women of faith and women of great vision. I want us to be women of such vision that when we are sitting at our dining room tables, we're not just seeing our children in desperate need of a haircut and wearing their pajamas and the, the fight, at whatever it looks like at your home, at our home, there's a, a lot of volume and uh, wrestling that goes on. And in my own natural vision, I can mistake who is sitting at my table. I often fail to see my kids as who they are in Christ Jesus. And I see them as loud, <laughs> and I see them as messy, and I see them as obstacles to my peace and quiet. But when I have right vision, I can see them as warriors and as a voice in their generation. And I can see that they are mighty men of God who have been placed in my family, sat at my table, and part of God's rescue team on earth in this hour. And I begin to see my children and I begin to have a revelation of who am I sitting in the presence of. And I begin to speak the purposes of God in and to them. And I begin to speak vision over them. Because there will be a time in their lives where the spirit of this world will attempt to dictate what they can and what they can't do. And I need my boys to know that he who is in them is greater than he who is in the world. And I need my boys to know that when that temptation comes to just roll over and say, oh, I guess this is, this is what the reality is, that they push back. And they say, well, this is what God says the reality can be. Those are the kind of children I will raise. And those are the kind of children God is calling us all to raise. And whether your children are grown or whether they continue to be cradled in your arms, hear this, your prayers change lives. Not just the lives of your children, but they change destinies and futures and impact future generations. I remember one day the Lord said to me, and I heard it so clearly, Sharon, your hunger today 
will feed generations tomorrow. And I began to be so convicted by that because it's really easy. And I think in this time of history, it's really easy to just flip the switch and coast and just be comfortable all the time and to become slack in our pursuit of God and in our hunger for the things of God. But when we have vision to see, oh wow, my life is not just about me. Wow, God, you have placed me on this earth, not just for my own comfort, but possibly for, for many others and future generations and what I do today impacts them. I begin to have a vision to see that what I do matters and it breaks me out of a place of apathy and it places me into a place of action and this is the lie that I believe the enemy hits again and again into the face of mothers and it's this I don't know whatever you think you're doing mom but it's not enough and it's not good enough and it's not changing anything and I've believed that lie because let me tell you, there is a temptation to walk by sight. And it is, we all can be prone to this temptation. And when we walk by sight, what we want is to know that what we're doing is significant. And often the way that we know that is to have the vision of others upon us. So sometimes we think if other people aren't taking notice of us, then we mustn't be significant. And that is such a a lie because the way the kingdom of heaven works is that it is the hidden places and it is the hidden most unexpected places that the glory of God chooses to reside and to hide and to be raised up in and through this is what God loves to do he loves to hide in in unexpected places and he loves to choose unexpected people and if we can be faithful in the secret place if we can be faithful God will do great things in and through our lives if we say yes to him just as Mary did I think about Luke chapter 1 when Gabriel comes to give this announcement, this supernatural announcement to Mary. And he says, Mary, you are going to give birth to the savior of the world. <laughs> I mean, we read that, it sounds great in Christmas stories, but just think for a second how ludicrous this is. This teenage girl sees this angel. This angel tells her something completely impossible that she's going to get pregnant even though she's never been with a man. That's scientifically not possible. Okay? The facts say that that cannot work. So a humanistic worldview would look and say, nah. But Mary says, Mary has a vision to see past her own reality. And she responds to Gabriel, let it be as the Lord declares. And because Mary said yes to God, because she had vision to see beyond her circumstance, it says in Luke 1, 41, blessed is she who believed the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Blessed are we when we trust God. Blessed are we when we say yes to God. And you know what the flip side of that is? If you look in Luke chapter 1, a couple verses back, an angel appears to Zechariah, and it's a very similar situation. He comes to Zechariah, who is Mary's cousin, and he says, you and Elizabeth are going to bear a son. And to be honest, the situation is a little bit more possible. <laughs> I mean, they're married. They can have a baby. But Zachariah says, you know what? This can't happen. <laughs> this can't happen. He did not walk as Abraham did, who said, God is the God who can bring the dead to life and who can make nothing into something. He said, no, 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 Gabriel. That can't happen. I can't have a kid. Elizabeth's not going to have a kid because 
uh, this is the reality of our situation. And do you know what? Because he didn't believe, because he chose a different response than prophetic vision, he was disciplined <laughs> and, and he was silenced for a time until he could see rightly. I want to be a woman that takes God's word at face value. God, if you've said something is possible, I want to believe it's possible. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God, move me to be a woman that says yes when you ask great things of me. And Lord, even if it's something that I don't think is great, let me see with right vision. Let me see the people you've placed in front of me. Let me see the circumstance that feels like nobody recognizes me. Let me see this as significant and to be faithful in the small things. I want to talk today about a passage of scripture where there are hidden figures, remarkable women of God who are all working in the background of a hero's life. And when we look at the lens of all scripture, we know about this one hero. We hear about him a lot, but we don't see these hidden women who were fighting, who were making a way, who were conquering things, who were boldly and courageously stepping outside of their comfort zones. We don't hear about them, but they were there and they've always been there. And I would dare to say, mothers, that these hidden heroes have often looked just like you do. Moms who faithfully show up day in, day out, who give and sacrifice in the secret places and who build heroes. And because they build heroes, they have become great heroes in the vision of heaven. We may not always be in the vision and in the forefront of this world, but I can guarantee you Mothers, you are in the forefront of heaven's vision. You are being celebrated every time you wake up in the middle of the night to nurse that baby. Every time you choose love instead of the, the harsh word. Every time you sacrifice sleep or money or time for your child, you serve the high purposes of heaven. Well, turn with me if you have your Bibles to the book of Exodus, where we're going to look at the life of Moses. Moses is a hero in the faith. Okay. We love Moses. We all love Moses. He's this great guy and we rightfully should celebrate Moses. He split the Red Sea with the help of God. He had access to God. He brought down the Ten Commandments and communicated it to the people. He delivered the Israelites from the enslavement of the Egyptian people. He was an amazing man. But just as Thomas Edison had all of these advances in, in sound and in electricity, he did all these great things. He did them because of someone hiding in the background. And in Moses' situation, there were many, more than just one, hiding in the background. And that's what I want to look at today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory. So, this is a, a time in history when the Israelite people, which are the Hebrew people, they were captured and in captivity of the Egyptian people. And the Egyptians were treating, they were, well, they were enslaving the Hebrew people, which means they demanded that these people work for them for free. And they made them build their cities and their storehouses, and they abused them and greatly oppressed them. 
and it was grievous to the heart of God. Never, ever, ever believe a lie when someone says, oh, God is a God of slavery. I've heard so many just ridiculous things. This grieved the heart of God. But something that the word of the Lord says in, in chapter one was that even the more they were being oppressed, the more the Israelites multiplied. Translation, the Israelite people were having a lot of babies. Things were good at home. <laughs> Maybe not so much out of the home, but they were busy and babies were being made. And this was alarming to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was the king of the Egyptians. This was, this was terrifying because Pharaoh was afraid that if the Israelites became too many, be, multiplied too much, they could actually begin to fight wars against the Egyptians and they would overpower and overthrow them. And so something that Pharaoh decided, <laughs> he just thought this would be a good idea. I'm going to cook up a plan to kill all the baby boys. All the baby boys had to die, but all the baby girls could live. I thought about that actually as I was preparing this and I was wondering, I wonder why he let the girls live. And it occurred to me, I mean, there's probably multiple reasons, but I really believe one of the reasons that Pharaoh allowed the girls to live was because they weren't perceived as a threat. The girls wouldn't go to battle. The women weren't dangerous. And this is why the Spirit of God hides in the most unexpected places. Because the things that the enemy does not anticipate, the things that the enemy overlooks, are the very areas where the glory of God is hidden and rise up. And this is the story that happens. Because even though the boys were supposed to die, do you know why the boys lived? This is why. There were two incredibly courageous midwives now you can read this story and breeze completely over them. They were two professional women. They were educated. They were working women. They hadn't had children yet, but they were going out into the homes of other Hebrew women and delivering their babies. And these are the women that Pharaoh approached and said, you know what? Whenever you deliver a baby boy, we're just gonna kill him, kill him off. And these women, even though they were subject to Pharaoh, and by disobeying Pharaoh, they wouldn't just lose their jobs. They, they would lose their lives, potentially. The word of the Lord says they refused to kill the babies because they feared God more. They had vision that went beyond just this reality. They knew that God was a God that surpassed Pharaoh. His rule was far more significant than Pharaoh's. And even though Pharaoh had great power, they didn't serve his vision. And they let the boys live. These two remarkable women, Pua and Shifra, that was their name. Those were their names. And it's important to hear their names because if you're a woman like me, perhaps you've looked through the history of the Bible and you see lineage is passed down on the names of the husbands and the sons and the husbands and the sons and another story of a great man and another story of a great man. And if we are not careful as women, and perhaps this is something that men do not perceive because they don't have the vision of being a woman and reading this and thinking, where do I fit in this story? It is important to hear their names. And it's important to have vision of these women because they've been there all along, even though they're not listed. They have been there all along. And I believe God has given me a, a burden 
an, an unusual vision to see his daughters all throughout scripture doing remarkable things so that I can tell you, so that you will hear and you will know that your role and your place in the kingdom of God is so significant. It's not less significant than that of a man. It's so valuable and precious to the heart of God. And these two women, these two heroes, hidden heroes of the faith, allowed the baby boys to be born. Well, now Pharaoh was pretty upset and he called the midwives to him and he was angry. He said, why are these boys being born? And the midwives The midwives, I mean, they could have died right then and there. And they said, these these Hebrew women, they're so vigorous that they have the boys before we even get there. And so boys were continued to be birthed and and the midwives were able to live. But Pharaoh decided he's going to take this situation into his own hands. And he was going to require that all the baby boys that were born were going to be thrown off the river, they were going to be thrown into the Nile River. Off the cliff, into the river, that is the story. I, uh, you know, we can read through these passages and just so briefly and not recognize the evil that is happening in these circumstances. For a ruler to say, for babies to be thrown off. And we began, we can become desensitized when we see evil happening so rampantly around us, but we should never forget that this was a very evil thing happening. Baby, babies should never be thrown into a river and babies should never be killed at birth. And this has never been the heart of God. And that's a message for another time. But there is an evil thing happening here. And this is what happens. And this is the the dimension that the enemy operates in. Tries to control what he can in the natural so that he can remain to be in power. And it often is by oppressing the people of God. Well... I want to, to turn to uh, chapter 2 and to camp out here for a while because this is my favorite part of the whole story. Chapter 2, after Pharaoh has commanded all of the babies to be thrown into the river, there's another courageous woman who defies these orders. About that time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special boy and kept him hidden for three months. Hmm. Now I've read that passage before and the Lord has highlighted to me that line. She saw that he was a special boy. And because she saw that he was a special boy, because she had vision to see something, her behavior was affected. And that got me to thinking, (laughs) what does a special baby look like? What does a special boy look like? I mean, I've seen my fair share of babies. I love babies. I mean, there's not one baby that's not absolutely fabulous. Like they're all kind of amazing. So what makes one baby more special than another? How did this woman who, and we know her name from chapter six, we know her name is Jochebed. How did Jochebed see that this baby was special? And so I thought I'd do a little word study on that word special because I wanted to see, you know, was he glowing? Was, was he like supernaturally just like levitating? What, what, what was he so amazing? So I did a study 
And it turns out that the transliterated word is, is tov. And it literally means good. He was a good baby. <laughs> he was good. He was cute. He looked good. Um, what? <laughs> he was good? The Bible doesn't say he was chosen, he was divinely anointed, he was supernaturally set apart. No, it doesn't say any of that. It says he was a good baby. So she fought for him. And that got me to thinking. You know, I would guarantee that Moses wasn't the only good baby born. I bet there were hundreds of good babies. I bet there were multitudes of babies that were good that got thrown over into the river. So why, why did Moses go on to become a great hero? Was it because he was supernaturally anointed and appointed by God and the favor of God was upon him? Or was it because he had a mother that had vision to see that he was worth fighting for? I would venture to say that it was Jacobed's vision to see him and to fight for him that made him who he is today remembered as. Could it be, could it be that Moses was who he was and he accomplished what he accomplished, not simply because he was Moses the Great, but could it be that the very same Moses born to another mother who lacked the vision to see her baby with prophetic vision, that he would have just been thrown over the river as all the other baby boys were? convinced. I'm convinced because this is how the kingdom of God operates. That God looks for people who will dare greatly, who will step out in courage and in faith. And he, his spirit leans into that. He's looking for those who are fully committed, who will say yes to him to bless those people. I mean, let's just evaluate for a second Moses the Great. Because if he was appointed even before time, he would be just this amazing leader who was sent to do incredible things. And you look at the life of Moses and he was, he was really not, well, we'll just say he lacked some leadership qualities. He was constantly doubting himself. And in fact, he had a speech impediment so brutal that he could not even speak to the people he was leading. He required a helper and that's okay. His brother was his, his mouthpiece. It's okay to recognize our weakness. We all have weaknesses and God actually can be glorified in our weaknesses, but that's not the point. The point isn't that God is looking for perfect people to empower. He's looking for people who show up, people who say yes, people who risk greatly. And this is what had happened in Moses' life. His mother took a chance. Being a mother of faith means we recognize it's not about having perfect kids, moms, okay? It's not about the perfect report card, ha having the all-class, all-star all athlete, having the kid that, that has the perfect manners. It's not about demanding perfection from our children. All of our children are good. They're all good. They're good. But if we have vision to fight for them, to take risks, to push them up, into places of potential, they can and they will become great. 
We do this by having vision to see th- to see them rightly and to impart into them, to speak over them the purposes of God, to champion them when they fall. Not to call as it is, not to, okay, so yeah, maybe your kids are, are a little sloppy. Maybe they're walking around the house and leaving crumbs everywhere. <laughs> This is cathartic for me. This is what my reality is. And there's a mess everywhere. You know, I'm not going to speak and say, my, you're such messy kids. Why can't you get your act together? Why can't you clean up after yourselves? You know, sometimes I actually do say that. <clears throat> okay. Woo. Confession moment. But we don't want to be mothers who are constantly nitpicking at our kids, cutting them down, telling them all the ways that they don't measure up. We want to call the greatness out of them. Call the greatness out of them, out of our sons, out of our daughters. Let them know their potential, what they can do in and through Christ Jesus to never give up on them, to always fight for them, to fight for them through that learning disability, through the health problems, through the bad choices that they're making, through the addiction, through the marriages that have failed, through the, con- the, the, the debt that's overwhelming them, through the feelings of depression and suicide, We are mothers that fight for our children and because we will fight for them, we will transform not only their lives, but the lives of multitudes. And that's what Jochebed did. Not only did Jochebed rescue Moses' life, her decisions led to the delivery, to the deliverance, of all of Israel, a whole nation of people, because she said, I will see and walk not by sight, but by faith. And I will choose to take leaps of faith, not to live within my comfort zone. Now there are so many other women in this story and and I could go on and talk about them, but for the sake of time, I won't. Miriam was another heroine. And, and then, of course, there was Moses' adopted mother. Then Moses went on to marry a remarkable woman. Women are constantly peppered throughout Scripture in hidden places doing remarkable things for the glory of God. I believe some of the greatest heroes in the Bible have always been powerful women fighting in the background, opening doors, making a way, winning wars that are accredited to others. And you know what? That's okay. Because this has always been the secret power of women. This is our superpower. It's our super secret power. We don't need to be seen and we need to fight against the spirit of the age that would demand that we are seen for all that we're doing and all, you know, sometimes Mother's Day, that's what it can be become. Look at me, worship me. And we need to fight against that temptation because our superpower is actually in our hiddenness, our strength to accomplish The impossible comes not in the natural, but in the supernatural. Lisa Bevere wrote a book called Lioness Arising. And there is this one line in the book that so stuck out to me. I had to write it down years ago and it remains on my desk and I look at it often. And it says this, she observes the lioness. And she's comparing the lioness to, to the strength and, and the prowess of, of a woman, of God. And she says, the lioness's strength is in her ability to almost disappear. It does not serve her purpose to declare her presence during a hunt. Women, this is our superpower that 
we can be hidden, that we can be in places that are hidden. Let the purposes of God be accomplished in our life and let us be rescued from needing and requiring the vision of others to know what we do matters. It matters. And God is looking to empower us in our secret hidden places and to give us vision to see that these places are so, so, so valuable and dangerous to the enemy. Let's be the kind of women who say yes to the Lord, who see rightly, who lift our eyes with vision to see, not with humanistic vision, to look at all our circumstances and say, well, I, I can't because I, I lost my job and I can't make rent and, and I'm all on my own and I'm, I'm lonely and no one cares about me and I'm so sick but no one can help. We are not these kind of women. We are women that say, I can. I can do all things. The impossible is possible with my God. And let's look at every situation in our life today that looks like it's dead, like it's dying. And let's speak a better word, the truer word. We speak to the reality, God's greater reality. And we watch God begin to move. That's the kind of women we are called to be. And that's the kind of women God is looking for. <sighs> Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one of these precious daughters hearing your word today. And I pray, Lord, that you would not allow any accusation or any shame to fall in their hearts, Lord, but only encouragement to call them into a place of significance. Lord, I pray that you would give each woman vision to see herself and her circumstance, not as it is in the natural, but as it is in your supernatural possibility. Lord, I pray that we would be women of great vision, calling things that are not as though they are, bringing redemption onto this earth, being part of your rescue plan, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in and through them. Let them recognize the value of being hidden. And Lord, that they've never been hidden to you. And God, I pray for, for a, a restoration of energy and of passion to rise up and to try again. Lord, that they would be women who teach their children and who walk in the ways that Thomas Edison's mother did. I'd say, I haven't failed. I've just learned 10,000 ways of doing it the wrong way. Give us vision to see rightly, I pray, in your precious name, for your eternal purposes. Amen. I love you so much. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. <laughs>